of July for Frank and I used to be uh, three cake week. On Canada Day, we would eat a red and white cake on July 1st. And then on July 4th, we'd eat some kind of red, white, and blue dessert. Maybe a tart, maybe a cake. And then on the 5th, it was my daughter's birthday, so we have blueberry upside down cake with caramel sauce. Well, we just don't eat as much cake anymore, but we have four reasons to celebrate on the first week of July. Because on July 6, 2006, Frank and I went down to the federal building and became citizens of the United States. Yes. Myself, Frank, and all of our children were born in Ontario, Canada, and we're proud of our heritage, and our Canadianisms still show. For example, maple syrup is still a staple in my kitchen, and we still believe that the Toronto Maple Leafs could win the Stanley Cup again. <laughs> and a toque is a hat, a Chesterfield is a couch, and the beaver is a truly noble animal. We began that immigration progress process in 1998. And Frank's job had brought us to Rochester, New York. And finally, on that sunny day in July, after hundreds of forms and dozens of photographs and multiple fingerprinting sessions and background checks and a citizenship test, we were finally ready to become Americans. And a thrill ran straight through me as I pledged and came forward to accept my citizenship papers. And that is how America became my <coughs> homeland. Now Jesus was born <coughs> in Bethlehem. And if you read Matthew chapter 4, it says in there that Capernaum was the home base for his new ministry. But Nazareth, where he grew up, was his hometown. It was in Nazareth that he hung out with Joseph, learning his trade as a carpenter. And it would have been the men in the synagogue as Na of Nazareth that taught him the scriptures and were, would have been integral in forming him in his Jewish faith. And Nazareth is where his brothers and sisters were born. And it would have been that Nazareth community that went to Jerusalem for Passover with them. And they would be the ones that remembered the fear and disappointment when he did not follow the rest of the group home that one Passover. <coughs> and his family had to go back and find him when he was 12. So we would assume that they would welcome him as a hometown son who'd done well, who learned so much and become, began an important and vital ministry. But the first century Palestinian culture was very different from our culture. We tell our children they can be anything they want to be as long as they work hard enough. We offer them the American dream, the ability to progress to a better life. A biracial child, born in Hawaii, partly raised by his maternal grandparents, can overcome moral struggles with drug use in high school and one day become president. But in first century Palestine, they based everything on the honor-shame principles. In that culture, one should not to aspire to elevate themselves above the status to which they had been born. Jesus, once a carpenter, returns to his hometown with 12 disciples following him, indicating that he's a rabbi. And his, he gets up to preach, and it's, it's, it's good, but they feel that need to take him down a notch. 
And so they say things like, this is not the son of Mary. Now we hear that and think, yeah, what's wrong with being the son of Mary? Lots of us pray to the Virgin Mary. But in that time and place, it was a slur suggesting and hinting at his illegitimate birth. It would be like saying, yeah, I know who your mom is, but who's your daddy? In a culture that was based on paternal lineage. They were dubious of his teachings that day. And they took offense at him. That word for offense used in verse 3. The Greek is scandaloso. To trip someone up. To become a stumbling block. Jesus came to lift them up, to show them how it could be with God. And instead, he becomes a falling down point. Their negativism is contagious. Jesus is bowled over by their lack of belief. And he can only do a few good works. Now, on one side of the Sea of Galilee, where the Gentiles lived. He'd been able to do lots of miraculous things. And on the other side of the Sea of Galilee that was predominantly Jewish, he was able to do miraculous healings. In fact, he even healed the synagogue leader's daughter. So it's not a matter of religion. Here in his hometown, where he knows and cares for the people deeply, he can only heal a few sick people. In business circles, they say that an expert is someone who comes from 50 miles away. Do we think like that at times? I'll confess that the articles that I read on the United Methodist website or the webinars I watch from there, I learn from because I give them a, a higher level of expertise. And the theologians that I've read, who've written books, have formed my way of talking about God. But I'm also willing to listen, to really listen to these voices, because there are experts right here, too. Our discussions in book club or Bible study or prayer shawl ministry shape people's faith. So our belief, our unbelief, can become scandaloso, a stumbling block. Or our faith can help create amazement, the kind that bowls people over and leaves no doubt. Let me tell you about how we became a cooling center this week. Last Friday when the power went off, I was focused on my family, my house, and how on earth I was going to get the sermon out of my computer and on paper. <coughs> and on Saturday, when I solved most of those problems, I began to worry about the other people in our circle that don't live in houses that have basements that stay cool. How are they going to stay cool? How are they going to eat without electricity? And by Sunday, when I'd actually got through phoning the people I worried about most, and the power had come on for the majority, I began to feel better. But I came on Monday, and we got together, and, and we were having our final discussion on what it meant to be Methodist. And Sharon Durney said, well, how can we become an emergency center? How can we offer help to our neighbors when they don't have power, but we still do? And at that moment, my perception of worry was changed to a perception of mission. And so the team split up, each with something to research. And we went back, and by Thursday, we had figured out that the Severn Church that has a um, disability access elevator was probably the safest, coolest place to meet. And the trustees had given permission. And the people at the Christian Assistance Program who had come in to use those services confirmed that there was still need in the community. And the sign was changed to tell people that we were a cooling center. 
by Friday morning, Anne Arundel Community Office of Emergency Management had listed us as a true cooling <coughs> center. And people from both churches had signed up to be hosts and hostesses. And we became open for business. But none of that would have happened if unbelief had prevailed. If someone had said, uh, heck, we've never done that before, we can't do that. It's going to cost us too much money to turn the air conditioning on. Or we're not in the business of cooling. Well, then it just wouldn't have happened. Instead, people moved out in faith. First of all, just having that idea was a step of faith. And then the trustees saying, yep, go ahead, was a, trust, a step of faith. And then the volunteers coming to be hosts and hostesses was a step of faith. When we work like that, then God can work through us in the most amazing ways. And God can help us bowl people over with the love of Christ. All we have to do is take those steps <coughs> in faith. Jesus wasn't undone by his hometown rejection. Instead, he expanded his ministry by sending out disciples two by two. These twelve had heard his teachings about the kingdom of God. They'd seen his liberating acts inviting people into the kingdom of God. And they had witnessed this rejection. So they have a sense what this ministry is going to be like as they go out. And Jesus tells them to go and only minister well where they are welcome. And they went out with Jesus' authority. And they made a significant difference by sharing the word of God and healing people. Now we're generally aware when we step out in faith and go out and minister to people and we hope for that welcome. But we aren't always aware when ministry is offered to us by the person that we share a pew with. Our welcome in church will determine whether those with Jesus in their heart will stay to minister to us or dust off their feet in testimony against us. Let me tell you about my personal experiences. Nine years ago, I slept, I slipped, I slunk, I was shy, I was scared like everybody else is. I slipped into a church in this community. And I nervously crept up the outside of the aisle, hoping that no one would see me, right? Have we done this before? And I sat down in, in a pew near the front. And thankfully, a woman named Bernice Boyer welcomed me into that church. And we became pew pals. And when later, when I offered to work with the youth, my ministry was accepted. And much, much later, in this town, once on Sunday, when Reverend Jim Clements and Reverend Margaret Clements were preaching together on God's call, I heard my own personal call to God's ordained ministry. But I may never have had a chance to answer that call in this community if I hadn't been <coughs> welcomed first. Look at the person sitting next to you, on either side of you, if, if, if there's a whole row of people. That person is a disciple of Christ. So how are we going to help that person grow? That person has spiritual gifts. Will they be welcomed here? And if that person sitting next to you is a child, don't discount that because many fine truths come out of the mouths of children. 
The Holy Spirit has brought each of us here today for some reason. For some, we are seeking healing. And for others, we've come to heal. Reach out and take the hand of the person next to you. And then you're going to have to do the same thing as you move around the room. And say to them, in Christ, I welcome you. Your gifts are welcomed here. In Christ, I welcome you. Your gifts are welcomed here. Jesus did not work in order to increase his honor or his status. His healings were not meant to be a sideshow. His um, driving out of demons where it's not meant for titillation. All his efforts pointed to the kingdom of God. He taught about the kingdom of God. His healings were done to show the kingdom of God. It was like a new day dawned through Jesus' presence here on earth. Hopefully our ministries will also point to the kingdom of God and hopefully they'll spread mercy and justice and we don't engage in them just to increase the number of people sitting in the pews. We want to be like joy-filled windows through which others can see God at work. Now for some of you, this has been your Christian family, your foundation, your home base for decades. You taught Sunday school to the men and women that are now leaders in this church. For others, you've become the heartbeat of this very body of Christ. Thank you. You have been the people through whom the Holy Spirit has worked. Some others of you have only been our guests for a year, a short time. And you've not quite found your niche, maybe. Or no one's invited you to become a member. Uh, to you, I say, your Holy Spirits are welcomed here. And I invite with you to visit me and share how you would like to serve or to be to hear if you would like to become a member. You can use one of the prayer cards so that I know that you need an appointment or one of the welcome cards. Today, there are others who are here for just about their first time. And I say welcome. May you find God's love here. May you find Christ's salvation here in this place. We have welcome cards in each pew. And I'd be delighted if you would write your name and address on one of those cards and then drop it in the offering plate. Because we would like to get to know you better. The church, this church, is on the cusp of a growth spurt. And with any growth, we might experience growing pain especially as we continue to invite new people into our midst and have God's grace work through them. I pray that no matter what, that each guest here finds our hearts open, as open as our doors are. And I pray that each person experience the love of Christ each time they come to worship with us. And I pray that all of us grow stronger together so that we can become a mighty source of God's power and God's tr transforming love in the world. Amen.